Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Eddie. Yeah, thanks. All right, and so it was about 1982, and I'd just taken a job at my neighborhood community center. It was a neighborhood here on the near west side, uh, across the freeway just north of Old Tiger Stadium on uh, Cochran and uh, Temple. And uh, I, my job was to run and develop youth programs, and I'm going around the neighborhood talking to folks about what we're doing, hope to do, and I kept bumping into this same guy named uh, Howard, Howard King. And uh, Howard's a tough person to describe, but uh, recently I was talking to a couple old friends, Danelle and Maurice, both of whom had been teenagers at the community center back then, and Maurice says, when he describes Howard, he tells people, imagine a cross between Muhammad Ali and Paul Bunyan. You know, he's larger than life. And Howard offered to help me run the open gym in the evenings. I said, sure, you know, I used to get the key for Pelham Middle School and I'd open the gym and the swimming pool for the kids to use. And um, I get there and we ro I roll out the basketballs and Howard says, hold on, don't pick up those balls. And next thing you know, he's got us all in a big circle in the middle of the gym. We're all doing jumping jacks and we're all doing um, push-ups and crunches and sit-ups and leg lifts. Then he's got us doing um, suicides. You know, and Howard's leading all of us with his jerry curl flying in the air. And uh, some of the teenagers hated it, but most of them grew to love it and love Howard. And um, soon, uh, soon afterwards, the center got a little grant to uh, add an extra position for the youth center. Uh, it was for a youth advocate, someone to work out in the community with teenagers who, you know, might be struggling. And I thought, Howard. So I asked him, he said, sure, and he filled out the application. I took it into the center uh, to Sister Helen. She was the one who had uh, started the community center and was its director, and I give it to her, and she looks at it and says, we can't hire him. I said, but Howard would be great, why not? She said, because he's a convict. You see, not that long before, Howard had just been released um, from Jackson State Penitentiary after serving over a dozen years. Uh, he'd been released on parole. You know, for a crime which we never talked about, but from what I'd heard from others, he'd always maintained his innocence. Um, and she says, Eddie, I want you to be the um, youth advocate. I said, well, I'm not applying for the youth advocate. I don't want to be the youth advocate. She says, well, I was going to slide so-and-so over into your position. I said, well, I guess I'm out of a job then. And she took a couple days, and um, she decided to hire Howard and, and kept me. Um, it was probably the best hiring decision she ever made, hiring him. And um, over the next few years, we had a blast running all these programs and coaching together. And, you know, then I left. I went to college. I ended up becoming a teacher. But Howard stayed working with the kids for the next 20, 30, 35 years. Um, you know, he, w he was incredible. Even when that center closed, he moved up the street to the Barnabas Youth Center over by the old Jeffries Projects. And, um, uh, continued to mentor and inspire kids, who many of them went out to be coaches and mentors and inspire the next generation and the, the next. And he started a, a business called uh, Black Man Enterprises, um, where he ran a, uh, he did uh, landscaping, snow plowing, so he could hire teenagers. Um, he started collecting and feeding the elderly in the neighborhood. Um, he, you know, he, he was an incredible man. He opened his home for p kids who needed a safe place to live. And he did all this till about three weeks ago when Howard died from um, pancreatic cancer. And you know, as his body wasted away from that horrible disease, his spirit still remained powerful. And we were at his uh, funeral. And I, I, I tell people it was a beautiful funeral. I mean, you know, I. You can't enjoy a funeral, but I did it because it was just one person after another after another telling Howard stories. I could have stayed there all day long from people who knew him throughout his life, um, you know, and people who visit him in his last few months, you know, um, said, you know, they went there to cheer him up or to, uh, you know, console him or to minister to him. But it was always Howard who would end up consoling, cheering you up or ministering to you. And uh, it was like that the last time I visited him. He was barely conscious, his eyes were closed mostly, and every now and then he'd open his eyes and say something. And one of the last things he said to me, he was, his eyes were closed, he opens up and he says, Steady Eddie, there ain't no black Santa Claus. 
See, he was conjuring up this 36-year-old memory. That first year we were working together in the youth center, someone, just before the holidays, somebody donated the Santa outfit. And it was huge. And I looked at Howard and I said, I guess you're Santa. <laughs> and sister said, you can't have a black Santa Claus. I said, sister, Santa is a mythical, magical character. Santa can be whatever he wants to be. And Howard was great. The kids loved him. You know, all the little ones, you know, white and black, they loved Howard. I, you know, I'm thinking the last three weeks over all these uh, Howard stories, I'm just so grateful for having known him. But I'm still a little angry. You know, I'm angry for those 12 years that he lost to incarceration. I'm you know, and I know Howard would tell me, Eddie, you can't even be worried about it because ain't nothing you can do about it. And he's right. You know, he's at rest, taking that eternal nap. But I think about the millions of people we keep locked up in this mass incarceration nation, and I wonder, you know, you know how much talent, how much genius, how many, you know, Paul Bunyans and Muhammad Ali's or Santa Clauses or Howard Kings were keeping locked behind bars.